teach, um, I teach assistant brewers. We teach really a hands-on experience class. I don't really give you as much of like the book smarts, but I give you the street smarts. So I think with the street smarts, you can go a lot further than just with um, book smarts. Um, you might make more money. Um, these Google. It's changing for you automatically. Let me do timers. Is anybody smart? Anybody know how to not put on a timer? Uh, just put a. Uh, yeah. We'll do this the old fashioned way. Okay. Um, does anybody know the five main ingredients of beer? You probably only have heard of four, but we're going to cover the fifth ingredient. Does anybody know any of them? One of them? Yeast. Yeast is one. Water. Water. Pops. Sugar. Some form of sugar. If we're making seltzers, then we know the last ingredient. Malt. Where do we get sugar? Malt. So malt barley. And the fifth ingredient, probably nobody ever talks about, but it is an ingredient, is gas. When I mean gas, I mean aviator oxygen, pure oxygen, CO2, or nitrogen. Couple of other byproduct gases, but these are the three gases that can manipulate beer that not really many people talk about, and I'll kind of cover throughout the process here. Uh, this is kind of a little diagram of the brewing process. Um, we start from, I can go for days on the brewing process. We're not going to cover the growing of any of these byproducts because um, that is a totally different craft. We're going to start from our raw ingredients, which is our barley up here in that bag. It's going to be milled. We're going to mash it, basically getting hot water and the malted barley. It's extracting uh, sugars. We're getting our enzymatic reactions. We're lottery, we're boiling, whirlpool, cooling, fermenting, maturing, filter, packaging, distribution. And I'm out for the day. Thank you, guys. All right. So now we're going to go more into depth here. Did you want to use a mouse, Eric? I figured you're not here. Um, so here's the malting process. This is what um, a large malster does. Um, they're going to harvest the barley from the farm, and they got to do this process called germination. So that little circle up there is a little um, barley kernel. They're going to get it moist and let it grow. So that's basically just a um, sprout growing. Once it grows there, about three to five days, and different temperature ranges, um, they're going to kiln it. Let's see if we got a picture. No. So after they get this germination, they kiln it, which is going to be stopping the reactions. We have the highest amount of sugars in our barley. Um, from there, and then we're going to roast it. It's kind of exactly like coffee. The longer they roast it, the more aromatic, the more dark resi um, residual aroma, burntness you get. The myad reaction. You guys are mostly HRT or Oh, wait, this is elective class. That's yeah, you, everybody. You, you've got so the myriad reaction, um, we'll cover that a little bit later. Um, if I leave it in there too long, it will combust. It will light on fire, and I'm sure there's plenty of monsters that have burned down because they have thousands of pounds in these drums rolling around malting. Um, so that's the kind of conveyor belt as it's going through from the germination process to go get malted. From there, um, from there, it gets shipped to a warehouse. From a warehouse, I put in a phone call, which I actually did today, and ordered my grain. There's hundreds and hundreds of different types of barley, hundreds and hundreds of different types of hops, we'll cover that, hundreds of different types of yeast, and hundreds of different types of water profile. Very similar to making like flour, where you have like three main ingredients, but you can manipulate the hell out of it and come up with totally different products. Um, that's why I love beer, it was very similar to food, exactly like food, you're taking a raw ingredient and making it something totally different, and one small manipulation changes it completely. Uh, so here, this is our grain silos. Um, this holds basically your um, two row or your base malts. This is where we're getting the majority of our fermentable sugars in our beer. Um, this allows us to order in bulk, and they'll come in a large truck and just pump it in through that corner up top and filling up into the silo so then on my brew day I'm going to hit the auger and it's going to pump out several hundred pounds into the actual mill this is I don't think that's your mill is it no it's 
stuff going down. Um, so this is what a mill looks like. Um, the grain is coming up from the top. It's going down inside the mill. And then there's these hard rollers. So we have these rollers on teeth that have been grinding it up. Right there, from the top coming down. There's teeth down here on a little pulley system powered by a motor. We're not looking for a flower. We're looking to just break the barley open, exposing the husks and the um, germ. Did you go over raw ingredients? Yes. I guess see all that. So you guys saw what barley looks like. It's edible. Uh, my favorite one is Edith Maris Otter. It's very hard and sweet. Um, so it's gonna get milled here to just barely crack and then come through here through an auger or a grist hydrator where then it goes to our mash water ton. Uh, there's many types of mills. You got two or three rolls. There's some that pulverize the crap out of them, make it flour so you can get a larger extraction. Um, but those are many different types. Um, so once we get our milled bar our milled malted barley, we need to add it to hot water to create our enzymatic reaction. Um, typically a brew house can be five, seven different vessels. Um, my facility, I'll show you pictures. I have one vessel. Um, I think you have two. Um, so it's going to be a boil kettle. In this case, a mash lauder ton is going to be the first one. We're adding our malted barley with our hot water. Um, temperatures are going to determine our body of our beer. A cooler temperature, you're going to have a thinner and a hot, hotter temperature, you're going to have a thicker, bigger body of beer. Um, there will be a chart for the different enzymatic reactions we're getting with the temperatures here. Um, and all we're doing is called mashing, mixing hot water and malted barley. And the malted barley could be any kind of ratio that the brewer is assigning. Um, from here we're resting um, a determined time by the brewer. In the first 15 minutes we're getting 85% of our reactions done right there. So you can mash 15 minutes and then start the process of Orloff or you can mash for an hour and do different techniques. Um, I'm going to cover just kind of a few techniques on brewing because there is many old tradition, there's new ways, different technology, different equipment is going to have all of its different ways to actually make the wort. I'm just going to cover a couple here today because we only have an hour. Um, from the mash, um, generally we're going to let it rest for about an hour. Um, it's going, the grain's going to be absorbing 20 to 30 percent of the water um, depending on our recipe and the type of grain so it's going to be more of a porridge after it rests so we need to add some hot water kind of to the bottom to kind of rewaken up some proteins and also so that when we do a process of orlock we don't really have a stuck mash um, some things we're looking about on mash we're looking for temperature ph and our grist ratio um, in my brewery, we do about 100 pounds to one barrel of hot water. Um, there's 31 gallons uh, per barrel. Um, not like an oil drum barrel, this is like an American beer barrel. So here's a couple pictures of uh, mashed tons. Um, you can see inside there, there's rakes. So as we're putting in our malted barley and mixing our hot water, um, Kind of like being like a DJ mixing your hot water and your cold water blending in to get that proper technique uh, temperature you know if it's too cold you bring in more hot water if it's too hot bring in that so you get that right dialed in as these rakes are spinning around slowly they're getting a good mixture good homogenization of all the malt and water if not we're gonna have like lumps clumps and bumps inside there and it's not going to get a good extraction of the hot water and our grits So here is a um, mash enzyme key. Um, as brewers, we try to fit in here between the beta and alpha amylase, um, trying to get um, a little bit different conversion rate of both of them. Um, again, there's many different types of mashing. You have decoction mashing, where you're starting at very low temperatures. So this is um, Celsius down here. So you're starting down here, getting these different beta glucase, and as you heat it up, bring up, get the uh, prolastic enzymes, you get beta, and you get your alpha. So I'm not gonna dive into any of that. Um, that would be talking, Gavin, it might bore you. 
Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, but we match right here in this like little happy medium spot right here. Um, again, a hotter mash for my beers are going to be a thicker body like my stouts. A thinner mash for nice dry pilsners down there. Um, so this is just kind of a chart over here we can look at. Um, you don't really need to know and understand it to understand the brewing process, but it's good to know the differences there. Uh, covered all of that. Um, so after we mash, we're going to do the technique called sparge and lauder. Um, as you guys probably already know, everything is German. Why is it German? Because Germany is awesome. Uh, but they were the first ones to kind of mass produce beer. Um, if you guys watch the How to a Beer Save the World, we have the English language, or we have the written language, we have mathematics because of beer. Um, and then the Germans just started really mass producing that, and they're awesome. So everything is sparge and laudering are German terms. Vorloff, all these terms are German. Um, so when we have our mash, we have to dilute it. So we have a very strong base beer. Um, we're going to dilute it with hot water from the top. So I have my big liquid, which is now called wort. We're going to be laudering our wort from the mash to our boil kettle as we're sparging hot water on the top. So as we're sparging, that beginning first wort is coming down from the mash, transferring, laudering over into our boil kettle. Once we get into our boil kettle, then we can start heating it up. So at my facility, we're starting off with about two barrels, let's say of mash wort water, and I want to finish off with four. So that means I got to sparge with a bunch more water to kind of dilute it down. Again, we don't want this very high sugar content. Um, it could be very astringent. Um, we want to kind of dilute it down so we can have a larger product as well. Or else I'm spending one day to get a half a day's work. Um, when we start boiling, um, we're doing boiling for a couple of reasons here. Um, one basically is for standardization. Um, people didn't know beer saved you because they boiled it. They thought it was just something they did. There was bugs and crap in the water. They were drinking sewer water, literally. The river was all nasty, dirty. And then they were boiling this product, which is now sanitary. They were staying alive. So that's one of the products. And then my odd reaction is simply you're heating something up and you're converting it to kind of, um, not to too scientific with this. You get that caramel reaction with it, with the my odd reaction. So things are kind of cooking. So if you already put like steak down on the grill or any vegetables, it starts getting that brown. So those sugars start to cook. So that's what we're cooking our sugars here. Also, we're condensing our wort, so we're making it stronger. When we start our boil, we can add, we can add hops. Um, they didn't start using hops for the last couple hundred years before it was like sprigs, whatever is naturally around you. Um, and hops became a real big thing when we started doing the, um, everyone knows IPAs, the history of IPAs? Uh, they'll do that today. They'll do that later today, so I won't jump ahead. Uh, but hops are preservative, basically. Um, they help preserve the life of the beer. So instead of boiling, now I have sugar water. It's going to have a lower shelf life. So adding the hops, it makes it preservative. Also, with adding hops, we're getting bitterness. So in the beginning of the boil, generally I boil about 60 to 90 minutes, depending on style. In the beginning of the boil, we're going to add our hops. That's going to give us the most bitterness. If I'm going about midway through, which is about 30 minutes, I'm going to get flavor and some aroma. Towards the tail end, last 10 minutes to zero, we get um, a lot of aroma with some flavor. And there's also a technique, um, I have it up here? Nope. Uh, whirlpool, whirlpool technique. I'm going to go on the next slide. Um, where we're going to be taking our boiled wort, and we're going to be chilling it down to a lower temperature. This is going to get a different reaction of the oil from the hops. Um, also, hops are very complex. Every different strain has a different reaction, different alpha, beta. Um, yeah, I haven't probably covered any of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll cover hops later with you guys. Um, I'm not a professional on hops. Um, there's a lot of oils and, um, and stuff that gets broken down at different levels. So 
when we're lowering our temperature in our whirlpool, we're getting a different extraction. We get a lot more aromatic and less bitterness from the hops. So all these West Coast, all these juicy, hazy IPAs, they're generally going to be lowering their whirlpool temperature and putting a crap ton of hops in the fermenter. Just wasting them. So here's, here's what I just covered. Um, 60 to 90 minutes for a boil. Um, the most flavor, again, is in that 30 to uh, 90 minutes. Aroma at that tail end. Here's that whirlpool. Um, and then continuous hopping. Has anybody heard of continuous hopping? Or anybody who knows dogfish head? So they created a 120 minute. Um, literally every minute he was adding in hops. You know why he did that? Just to do it. Nobody had done it yet. Nobody had done it before. Um, I think he created this little device off of a, a like a foosball or like an air hockey thing. Mm -hmm. And every minute he would open it up, shh, hops would shoot in, shh, just to do it. So that's the beauty about beer. Um, very similar to food. You know, we do things because I feel like it. You know, I make a sour IPA yesterday because. I like IPAs, I like sour, let's see if it comes out great. Um, just to do it, you know, we had that experiment. That's why beer is so fun. Um, so here's our whirlpool. Um, after we're done boiling our ward, um, we're gonna bring it from our kettle into our whirlpool. See, it's got this little hose here, kind of creating this whirlpool technique. So as this is doing this, um, generally we have a conical bottom, bottom in your um, hot liquor tank or whirlpool, you're collecting, this is called trub. Trub, true, um, how, do you, how do you say it? Uh, true. True. Um, so the true is a bunch of protein that collected during the boil. Um, could be hop, could be protein, break up from the, um, the beer, the wort. Um, and we don't want that going into our fermenter. Um, that could lag fermentation, get a lot of off flavors. We don't want this solids in our fermenter. Also, you can add spices into your brew, um, like my Belgian wit beer. I put chamomile, coriander, and orange peel. Um, the orange peel and zest comes straight from the farm here. I literally go to the farm. Um, we went there Thursday and Wednesday. I got 20 pounds fresh off hot off of the um, tree, so that's the dumb, put them in like the last 10 minutes of boil, put a chamomile in there to kind of give it that um, medicinal kind of um, flavor, also gives a really nice white creamy head to it, and then coriander to kind of give it that spice note to it, it's also stylistic. Um, try to keep things local, I'm trying to find a local coriander, which is cilantro, or cilantro is coriander, if you speak Spanish you already do that. Um, okay. So after we go from our boil to our whirlpool, we need to cool our wort down. Um, this is going to be through our heat exchanger, different sizes. This technique or this um, technology hasn't really changed in the last couple hundred years, and it's very basic. Um, I got hot wort coming in, going down these, and cold water going on the other side. So it's just an exchange of energy. So I have my hot wort coming up down all these plates and you have your cold water coming up and down. So as the hot wort comes in, it's gonna leave out cold. And as that cold water comes in, it's gonna come out hot. It's just never touching each other, just plates on the other side of plates, exchange of energy. Um, then we know why we wanna cool down our wort. Do you know what yeast is? Temperature yeast like? Like boiling. So if we put yeast, no big bakes here. Um, so we need to throw our yeast in there. Yeast likes about 20 degrees Celsius, um, which is 75 ish. Owen converted me to Celsius and I literally don't know Fahrenheit. 68. 68. Um, I like teaching Celsius to my students because I get a lot of them coming overseas and a lot of them want to go invest overseas as well. And in America, we're the only ones who use Fahrenheit really. And it kind of helps you learn the rest of the world instead of just being Americans, as uh, Ben would say. So our hot water is coming in, coming out cold. 
cold water coming out hot and we're going to save this hot water either into a hot liquor tank to clean it later. Uh, my facility, I don't have one, so I'm gonna save it right back into my boil kettle to use that to clean later. Um, breweries waste a lot of water and in our drought state we live in, there's over a thousand breweries right now. Um, that might be a reason why we're losing all our water. Um, our ratio is about four to five pints per drinkable pint. <coughs> um, I do a really good job on reusing water, um, not hosing down the floors if not needed, um, but some of them are up to 10 or 12. Um, the big guys like Coors are actually really good on their water. They can reuse it, they have water resources. Um, and in a, we're in a drought, there's no, there's no going back from we're gonna be in drought probably forever. Um, so we can do what we can. So saving that water is very viable for us. After it leaves our heat exchanger here, we're gonna go into our fermenter. So this is actually a picture of my fermenter down the hill. Um, we need to aerate. So the fifth ingredient I was talking about, this is one of them, this is oxygen. So as the wort is cool, we're pumping that right into our fermenter and we're aerating it. This is giving yeast a fresh breath of air. Without it, they really struggle to ferment. Um, there, you can also manipulate, if you have a lot of air, less air, you can get different extra profiles. Um, so this is where uh, an advanced brewer, you can have a dissolved oxygen meter and you're gonna figure out what's the level going into the fermenter. You know, am I at 10 ppm or I'm at like 30? Loggers are gonna need a lot more um, air versus ales. And we're gonna cover loggers and ales here shortly. So after it's cooled down through the heat exchanger, we're gonna go into our fermenter here and we're going to inoculate our wort. Once I start inoculating our wort, the man, the government, cares everything I do now. Because now, this is taxable, this is alcohol. They don't care pretty much anything else before that, it's just sugar water. Now that it's alcohol, somebody can get intoxicated, they want their money. Um, if you guys went over Ryan Heights Kaboot, um, if you will. So that, if you guys learned about that, but that was all about taxation and money. Everything in this world is, is sadly about money. So once we inoculate, it becomes um, beer. So to kind of go back on the wort production side, we have our malted barley, we mix it with our hot water, we're going to mash or steep it kind of like a tea for at least 15, 20 minutes, get that reaction going. We're gonna begin this process of vorloff, which we're taking that wort from the bottom, kind of refiltering it on top of itself this is creating a thicker, denser mash bed and also creating a nice filtration system. So after we're Vorloff, we're gonna do sparge and lauder. Lauder is taking that beautiful wort from the mash to the boil kettle and then sparge is taking our hot water from the bottom or wherever it's at stored in a hot liquor tank to the top of our mash, transferring from the mash into our boil kettle. From there, we're boiling it um, 60 minutes is about the ideal time. You can go longer, you can go less. Just really need, I'm sure you could probably boil for five minutes, that's sanitary. You don't really need to add hops. Um, I don't know, you know anybody's done five minute boils? Not on purpose. <laughs> um, and uh, we've done studies whether you have like a very active rolling boil versus a simmer. Um, there's not really too much of a difference. You're still really getting a breakdown of the hops and the extraction point, so there's not a huge difference. I've had my, I'm running on electric, I've had my heating element go out on us a couple times because we're overworking our little brew house. Um, it's designed to maybe do a couple brews a week and now we're doing five or six a week. So definitely maximizing it. Um, but when you get to that point of overdoing things, you find different techniques that you would never found out if you didn't push yourself so hard. Uh, that's also a life lesson right there. You never know what you're capable of doing unless you push yourself to that verge of break almost. So after we're done with that boil, we're gonna go into our whirlpool. It's going to um, let all the trub kind of coagulate. We can use um, different uh, filtration systems. Um, the wine industry, they kind of use dish scales and 